Hello everyone, my name is Ed Rilio. I'm a senior research scientist from NVIDIA Applied Deep Learning Research. In this talk, I'll cover our latest research progress on VLSS, which is short for Deep Learning Super Sampling. We just announced the next generation of VLSS, and we're calling it VLSS 2.0. It's a deep learning-based image reconstruction technique designed for real-time rendering, and it can make your games run almost twice as fast. Before I get into it, I want to give credit to everyone in the research team behind DLSS. In, at NVIDIA, there are so many people who have given tears, sweat, and blood to DLSS, and there are even more people who have contributed to the productization side of DLSS as well. This is a quick overview of my agenda. Since we just announced DLSS 2.0, in the first section of my talk, I'll go through the list of really great features that we're providing through DLSS 2.0, and also compare DLSS 2.0 to the previous generation of DLSS. In the next section, I'll discuss from a technical level, why is image super resolution for gaming a really challenging problem, and why is deep learning really important for solving this problem well? And then I'll end my talk with some tips for integrating DLSS 2.0 to a modern game engine. Let's first discuss our motivation for doing research on things like DLSS. Well, we believe that the technology used for next generation gaming is gonna quickly drive up the GPU compute demand exponentially. We have things like real-time ray tracing, realistic physics simulation, AR VR rendering, and we're targeting higher and higher pixel displays. And ray tracing alone is already demanding several times the compute power compared to traditional rendering techniques. So some sort of super resolution will become more and more of a necessity going forward for next generation rendering. The next motivation is that for all the RTX GPUs, we're shipping tensor cores, which are a dedicated hardware unit for accelerating deep learning workloads. They can provide 110 teraflops of compute power just for deep learning for neural networks. So it's natural for us to try to figure out ways to also make the gaming experience be benefited from this tremendous amount of compute power. It was for those reasons that we shipped the first generation of DLSS over a year ago. And the idea behind DLSS was really simple. We first would have the game engine render a low resolution uh, image, and then we run a neural network in real time to basically process this image to make it high resolution. And this neural network was, was trained offline on supercomputers using a large amount of really high quality data that we collected just for this game. And of course, this whole process was accelerated using tensor cores. That's why we can achieve really great, tremendous performance boost uh, for the entire rendering pipeline. So the first generation of DLSS was really visionary and revolutionary. It's the first ever deep learning algorithm shipped in games. But we know we can still better, still do better. We want to get better image quality. We want to get better performance, faster inference. We also want to get better generalization so we don't have to train DLSS per game. So the research behind DLSS definitely continued nonstop. And over the last year, we've basically improved every aspect of DLSS, from the training methodology, the loss function, the data set, the how the algorithm interact with the game engine, to ultimately redesigning the entire architecture so that it's now much better at doing super resolution for game rendering. And we're calling this reinvented architecture DLSS 2.0. DLSS 2.0 provides a list of really awesome features. The first one of which is that the image quality is just great. It looks definitely better than previous generation DLSS in terms of the level of detail and temporal stability. It also looks better than other reconstruction technique without using deep learning. And there are places where it looks even better than native resolution rendering. And I'll show you example later. The second great feature is that we can achieve that great image quality even when doing 4X pixel upscaling. That means we go from 540p to 1080p, 720p to 1440p, or, or 1080p to 4K. That basically means every three out of four pixels that you see on screen are actually generated by a neural network, not actually rendered by the game engine. And thirdly, DLSS 2.0 is a fully generalized model. That means when we try to integrate DLSS into new games, we don't have to go through the really labor intensive and error prone process of collecting new training data and train a custom DLSS model just for that game. We now maintain one best DLSS model that will be integrated and applied to every new game that we try to integrate to. And this will make integrating DLSS into a new game much easier than before. And lastly, we've also tremendously improved the inference speed. Right now, the, the whole algorithm runs about 1.5 milliseconds at 4K on a 2080 tie. 
that basically uh, means combining with the fact that we can render at low resolution because we support 4x pixel scaling, the performance increase from DLSS is really huge. Let's now look at an image quality comparison example for DLSS. So this is one of the shots rendered in Infiltrator demo in UE4 at 720p. That's why it looks a little bit blurry. Let's try applying DLSS 1.0 to this image and upsample it to 1080p and see what does it look like. Boom. You'll see things are get definitely sharper and edges are more pronounced. So that's good. It looks better than native 720p. I'm going to flip back and forth one more time. 720p, DLSS 1.0. So let's compare at the exact same spot with the exact same input, but upscale with DLSS 2.0. Boom. Wow, I think it's not hard to notice. We're actually getting a lot more extra details compared with the 1.0 reconstruction. Let's flip back and forth one more time. 1.0, 2.0. So that's great. I think it's an obvious improvement. Let's compare with native 1080p rendering. So this is what you would get if you, if you actually render at 1080p. And uh, flicking back and forth, 2.0, 1080p, 2.0. I think you'll notice actually, even though DLSS 2.0 is only rendered at 720p, it actually provides extra details compared with the native 1080p rendering. And that's really great. As mentioned previously, DLSS 2.0 support up to 4x pixel scaling. So now let's demonstrate applying DLSS 2.0 to upsample this 540p image into a 1080p one. Boom. I think it's really obvious that the image gets a whole lot clearer and more details compared with the 540p input. Let's uh, flip back and forth one more time. 540p and, and 540p to 1080p upsampled by DLSS 2.0. Here are some 200% zoomed in comparison of the previous result that you saw. On the top row, you notice that DLSS 2.0 is able to reconstruct a more detailed image from only 540p input than DLSS 1.0 from 720p input. And from the left column, you'll see that DLSS 2.0, even rendering only a quarter of the pixels uh, from 1080p, it's able to reconstruct an image that's really close, if not even better or more detailed than native 1080p rendering. And then, of course, you notice that the DLSS 2.0 result with 540p input is looking way better than native 540p rendering with TAA. Another zoomed-in comparison with a different cropped region. You should be able to see the same thing as before, that DLSS 2.0 is getting a really close image quality with native rendering while only rendering a quarter of the pixel as input. And then, similarly, DLSS 2.0 is outperforming DLSS 1.0 in terms of image quality with less pixel as input. This is another set of comparison from a different scene. This is a typical AAA quality forest scene with really dense geometry. And we've turned on real-time ray tracing. That's why we're only getting about 80, 89 FPS when rendering at 540p. But you know, the image really suffers at 540p. Everything's really blurry and we're, we don't have enough resolution to resolve all the details in the foliage. And if we increase the resolution to 1080p, of course, we get way more detail in the final image, but the frame rate dropped to 48. And this is what it looks like if we apply DLSS 2.0 to the 540p rendering. You will notice that we get most of the performance back around 86 FPS now, and the image quality is largely the same with native 1080p rendering. I'll try to flick back and forth. 1080p and 540p to 1080p with DLSS 2.0. In fact, I do notice there are some differences in the quality in the foliage region. So let's compare with the ground shoes. This is the ground shoes, 32 SPP at 1080p. And if I flick back and forth between ground shoes and DLSS 2.0, you'll see that they're really close, almost identical. That means that we're getting a more correct result with 540p input than native 1080p rendering. This is the final set of comparison with 200% crops. I think it's not hard to notice that DLSS 2.0 with 540p as input is actually matching better with the reference than native 1080p rendering. And then of course the 540p result with DLSS 2.0 is looking a lot more detailed and better than 540p native rendering. Hopefully you liked what I just told you about the image quality side of DLSS 2.0. Next, let's look at the performance side of DLSS 2.0. Because DLSS now support up to 4x pixel scaling, we can be really flexible and provide users with a list of configurations that 
provides a different trade-off between performance and image quality. We're providing basically three different quality modes, performance, balanced, and quality. And that translates to the number of pixels is basically performance means 4x pixel upsampling, and balance is 3x pixel upsampling, and quality is 2x pixel upsampling. And as 4K as an example, if we're targeting 4K, performance basically means we'll, we'll be upsampling from 1080p, and balanced is 1260p, with quality being 1440p. The way that DLSS 2.0 accelerates the rendering pipeline is that it first reduces the cost of the rendering process itself by simply rendering fewer pixels. Because DLSS 2.0 now supports really large scaling factors, like up to 4x, that means we can just directly cut off a lot of the cost in all the pixel workload, including like gbuffer filling, lighting, real-time ray tracing, or all the screen space effects. And these things are typically what's the most expensive part of the rendering pipeline anyway. The exact amount of performance saving they would get from this pixel count reduction really depends on how pixel bound you are. And of course, the more pixel bound you are, the more performance benefit that you'll get from DLSS. And this also means that DLSS 2.0 will benefit the most for those games which are using really advanced and expensive rendering techniques, such as real-time ray tracing. On top of the reduced rendering cost, DLSS will introduce an overhead for neural network inferencing. And this overhead is almost fixed, it's resolution dependent. And thankfully, with DLSS 2.0, we also managed to dramatically reduce this overhead almost by 2x. This chart shows the cost of DLSS 2.0 on a number of GPUs at various resolutions. Notice on a 2080 Ti at 4K, it's only costing about 1.5 milliseconds now. Next, let's look at some real numbers for the performance boosts from DLSS 2.0. This diagram is showing the quality mode, which goes from 720p to 1080p in control. Notice that across the board, we're, we're getting more than 1.5x of speed up in this game, which is really cool. And then we have performance mode, this time going from 1080p all the way to 4K. Just look at all the crazy amount of performance that we're getting. Like all the frame rates are more than doubled. Look at the 2060 bar. We're going from 8 FPS to 37 FPS, from a non-playable experience to a playable experience. This also means that you can enjoy control at 4K with all the ray tracing effect turned on with great image quality on a 2060. And this is really awesome. Obviously, we think what we have achieved is really impressive, and we're definitely not alone. Here are some quotes from the online reviews for DLSS 2.0. Digital Foundry says that DLSS is impressive to the point where I believe you'll be nuts not to use it. And Hardware Unboxed says that the upscaling power of this new AI driven algorithm is extremely impressive. It's basically a free performance button. And right now, DLSS 2.0 is already shipping in the following titles For Wolfenstein Young Blood and Deliver Us the Moon, DLSS is available right now. And for Control and Mac Warrior 5, DLSS 2.0 will be available later this week. Now that we have looked at all the great features provided by DLSS 2.0, let's be a little bit more technical now. In the next section, I'll walk through some of the related work in a domain of image super resolution, and then discuss why image super resolution is particularly challenging for real-time rendering, and then hopefully provide some high-level insight on why deep learning is critical and valuable for solving some of those challenges. To do that, let's go back to the most basic thing and revisit Reconstruction 101, because I think Reconstruction really lies at the heart of the problem that DLSS is trying to solve. So let's imagine we're now given a function that is defined continuously in this 1D domain. And uh, we're given the task of basically plot this function out or render this function, but we don't know exactly the analytical definition of this, this function, we don't know the equation that defines this curve. So what can we do? One thing we can do that we always do is, is that we just take a bunch of discrete samples of this function. In this case, we're taking seven discrete samples at some equal distant intervals. And then given a bunch of samples, we can infer, infer, the, uh, infer the original function based on these samples. And you know we can apply different kind of filters that connect the, the dots together. In this case, I, I just apply a simple linear filter, and we get a you know a rough reconstruction of the original function. You can see that because our sampling rate is low, we have only seven seven samples. 
that's why the, the reconstruction that we get is actually not matching 100% with the original function. In fact, there is a huge dent in the middle of the function that get missed by our reconstruction. And, and that's normal. One trivial way to increase our reconstruction quality is to simply increase the sampling rate. Like in this case, we increased the number of samples from 7 to 13. And now you can see that we, we successfully recaptured the dent in the middle of the function. And then overall, we get a reconstruction that's matching much more closely to the original function than our previous reconstruction. This sampling and reconstruction process is actually happening within every frame of the rendering pipeline. Because during rendering, we ha we're give it basically given a, a bunch of scene geometry, which can be thought of as a function that is defined continuously in the 3D world. And we don't have easy way to, to easily vectorize these functions and just plot them out. We, can, we still only have to take discrete samples and, and basically discretize them into pixels before finally rendering them. So in this case, we have a triangle on the left. And to render it, I'm, I can use a 4 by 4 pixel grid. And with, with this sampling rate, taking only 16 discrete samples, the reconstruction quality of this triangle that I get is, is pretty low. Like We can barely tell it's actually a triangle. Of course, if again, we just quadruple our sampling rate, instead of using a 4 by 4 grid, we, we switch to using an 8 by 8 grid. Now we can get a much higher quality reconstruction that's matching a lot more closely to the original triangles than our previous reconstruction. With that background in mind, we can now take a look at the problem statement of DLSS. What DLSS tries to achieve is to basically get the same high resolution reconstruction quality using only input taken from low resolution sampling rate. And of course, both, the, both these things matter because the reconstruction quality directly correlates to the final image quality and the sampling rate directly correlates to the performance. In graphics, there's definitely a positive correlation between the final image quality and the cost of the rendering process. Basically, to get better image quality, you either have to render at higher resolution to get better details, or you have to use better rendering techniques that are more expensive to get better shading quality. So we hope with DLSS, in general, we can just increase the efficiency of the rendering process so we can get better image quality at the same rendering cost, or to get better performance and achieve the same image quality. The idea of image super resolution is definitely not new, and there were a lot of work done in this area. So in the context of this talk, I'll try to divide those previous work into three main categories. And the first one is single image super resolution. Single image super resolution is like the classic ill post problem because to solve it, we have to really invent new information that is missing in the low resolution input. And the common choices of solution, including ranges from using simple interpolation with kernels like bilinear, bicubic, lanchos, or they can some even apply some contrast aware sharpening after applying the interpolation kernel. So all these, they belong to um, single image resolution. Ever since the rise of deep learning, especially convolutional neural network, uh, the state of the art of the single image super res has been pushed forward by a large margin. People started training neural network that tries to learn a mapping from the low resolution input to a high resolution image. Uh, and basically during inference, the network will uh, try to find the structure of the local pixel neighborhood. And based on the strong prior in the training data, it can actually hallucinate details that doesn't exist in the, uh, in the low resolution input. So in, in other words, it is really like inventing new information with a single image. It is definitely really challenging for us to directly apply single image super resolution based technique in the context of real time rendering because, well, first, it's the interpolation based method. The results they produce is just so blurry and lacking so much detail when compared with the reference or native rendering. There are some people who have like successful experience with doing small upscaling ratio, for example, for 1800p to 4k with interpolation plus sharpening. It looks somewhat close to native 4K, but if you, we try to apply the same thing to 1440p to 4K or even like 1080p to 4K, the result that you get is just going to be so blurry and so bad, it's never really going to work out. So what about those deep learning based image super resolution methods? Well, it is true that if we throw a neural network at this problem, the image that it produces will be way more detailed compared with those that we get from interpolation. But still, the extra detail that we get from the neural network is actually hallucinated based on the strong prior that is embedded in the training set of the neural network. 
it's that means it's very likely that it's gonna look inconsistent compared with the native rendering in terms of style or the way that it looks. And for DLSS, it's actually really important that we do want to pursue to match with the ground truth or reference as close as possible. And the other important reason that it's not suitable is that uh, for imaging, for rendering, we really want to produce a sequence of images that are temporally stable across each other, meaning there's no popping or flickering. And for a single image methods, uh, there's just no constraint in the model that force them to produce temporally stable results. This is a quick demonstration of a 1080p image upscaled from 720p using deep learning. It's actually looking quite different from native 1080p rendering. Just pay attention to that bushes there. Look at the leaves. And the deep learning version is a lot bigger and fatter when compared with the native. While the deep learning version does look plausible, I mean, there are leaves that look like that. For DLSS, we do always want to match as close as possible with the native rendering in terms of the look and style. Let's show another set of comparison really quickly. This image is rendered at 1080p natively with TA, so this one should be treated as the reference or ground truth. This one is 540p rendering upscale to 1080p using DLSS 2.0, and I think it's pretty easy to see that it looks really close to the reference that I showed earlier. This one is also 540p upscale to 1080p but using bicubic interpolation. So it's really obvious that it's so blurry and losing a ton of detail compared to the reference that I showed earlier. This one is actually 540p upscale to 1080p using ESR GAN, which is one of the really recent research on using deep learning for image super resolution. And this one is done with generative adversarial network. And while overall it definitely looks a lot sharper and more detailed compared with the bicubic interpolation results, if you pay closer attention to all the foliage and all the bushes, you notice that it's still lacking a lot of details compared with the native rendering. They're just generating pattern that's not really matching with the native. And also pay attention to the sky. There's actually some corrupted pattern there. That's just another demonstration that uh, using this type of approach, we might lead to inconsistent result with the actual look of the native rendering. Now let's look at these comparisons with the 200% crop. I think it's pretty clear that both the ESR GAN result as well as the bicubic interpolation results are just lacking details and blurry compared with the native 1080p rendering. But on the other hand, if you look at the 540p DLSS 2.0 results, every single strand on the leaves are just crystally clear. I think when compared with the 1080p, I would say that the DLSS 2.0 result is actually providing more definition than native, even though the LSS 2.0 is only taking a quarter of the pixel as input. The next category of the previous work on image super resolution is multi-frame super res. Unlike single frame super res, where you really have to invent new information that doesn't exist in a single low resolution input, with multi-frame super res, we do have a lot of information available to us in the window of multiple low resolution frames. Basically, we have to figure out method to combine multiple low resolution images into a single high resolution one. So this problem is definitely less ill-posed compared with the single image super res resolution. And it often restores true optical details much better than single image super res. Most of the previous work for multi-frame super res are designed for videos or burst mode photography. They're not leveraging uh, some of the really useful rendering specific information that a renderer can provide. For example, they use optical flow to align multiple frames, whereas in rendering we can use geometric motion vectors, which is cheaper to generate and is also more accurate for, for the purpose of anti-aliasing. And also there is some difference between the pixel in videos versus the sample in graphics. In graphics, we can take an accurate point sample of the scene function, and also there are also more information available in samples. We can have HDR value, we can have exposure, sub-pixel offset, we can even have depth. And finally, some of the previous approach on multi-frame super res use both frames in the past and in the future to reconstruct a high resolution current frame. And that is something that we cannot afford in real-time rendering. The third category of the previous image super resolution work is spatial temporal supersampling designed for rendering. Temporal anti-aliasing, or TAA, definitely belongs to this category. 
The reconstructed image from TA is actually at the same resolution as the input, but it achieves anti-aliasing by accumulating temporally jitter samples within a pixel over multiple frames, so it is still temporal supersampling. There are also many temporal rendering works that does reconstruct the final image at a higher resolution than the input. In particular, there is a, vari and there is a variant of TAA that has been shipped in UE4 called Temporal Anti-Aliasing Upsampling, or TAU. It modifies TAA by taking into account the subpixel offset of each sample during accumulation, so it actually can support arbitrary scaling ratio. Finally, we also have checkerboard rendering. It also works by alternating the sampling pattern between adjacent frames in a checkerboard manner and resolve them over multiple frames. It is only limited to 2x upscaling ratio because of the checkerboard pattern, and it also requires quite invasive engine changes to support. But checkerboard rendering is very popular among game consoles. Spatial temporal supersampling works by exploiting the temporal coherency in the rendering process. Because we know the image sequence that we render over the course of multiple frames is temporally stable, which means it's less likely to have sudden changes or popping or flickering happening across frames. So we can assume that the previous frame that we have is pretty much the same or aligned with the current frame that we, that we're, which we're trying to reconstruct right now. So pretty much this means we can smartly distribute our samples over the course of multiple frames. And then when we try to do the final reconstruction, we'll use the samples collected both from the current frame as well as those collected from the previous frames. And this will be really good because uh, over the, uh, for each frame, we're still using a really low sampling rate, which means our performance will be good. And then the reconstruction quality will be really high because we, we're using a lot more samples uh, than, than just the samples from the current frame. And those samples are, are really taken from the function that we're trying to reconstruct. They're not from hallucination or interpolation. But the assumption that the previous frame function is aligned or the same with the current frame function is a really huge assumption that is probably never true. Because if it is true, then the game will be just so boring. In the game scene, pretty much everything is moving every frame. We have dynamic lighting, animated characters, particles, moving shadows. Those moving stuff is what makes games fun. So if, if we just naively use samples collected over the course of multiple frames to do the final reconstruction, we'll end up having error in our reconstruction. And those error will translate to artifact in the final image like lagging or ghosting. So all the spatial temporal supersampling technique uh, for rendering would have to deal with the fact that the previous frame might be different with the current frame and they need to handle this robustly. That is why in all the temporal upsampling technique like TAA, TAU, or checkerboard rendering, there's a really important step that rectifies the samples that we have collected in previous frames before using them uh, to reconstruct the final current frame. That means we have to invent heuristic to somehow identify the samples that might have really large error in them. And then we have to invent more heuristics to somehow fix those error while still making the final image look plausible and good. And these heuristics often just trade off between different artifacts. Sometimes when they correct the, the error in the history samples more aggressively, they end up having blurriness or temporal stability or even more a pattern in their current frame image, image because they have so less samples to work with. On the other hand, when they try to use much more than they should on the history information, they'll have lagging and ghosting in the final reconstruction. Among all the heuristics used for rectifying samples collected from previous frames, Neighborhood clamping is definitely one of the most commonly used techniques. And the idea behind neighborhood clamping is also pretty simple. Basically, for each one of the previous frame samples, we just need to clamp them to be within, within the bounds of their neighboring current frame samples. And to put it graphically, in the middle, you notice that some of the red dots are moved up or down to be within the bounds of their neighboring green dots. That's pretty much it. So, Finally, we just do the reconstruction with all the current frame samples with, along with all the corrected previous, previous frame samples. So the good thing about this technique is that it strikes a really good balance between achieving a, a lagging or ghosting free image versus also in the meantime resulting pretty good uh, temporal stability plus details uh, in the final image. But do notice that 
if you apply tech heuristic like this, we are going to lose some details because of this. For example, there are samples uh, in history frame that shouldn't have been corrected by, by the neighborhood clamping because uh, those samples are actually valid. They are actually matching with the current frame samples. Next, let's visually demonstrate some of the things that we've been discussing about temporal supersampling as well as uh, history rectification and how important it is. So this is an image rendered with temporal anti-aliasing, but with the neighborhood clamping step disabled. So now when I, when I basically I'm trying to pan the camera to the right, that causes some disocclusion. And when that happens, we have huge amount of ghosting left on screen. So that this type of result is definitely not acceptable for any shipping games. So we definitely need history rectification somehow. However, when we do apply neighborhood clamping, it will actually introduce some additional loss in detail in the final reconstruction. And I think this is a pretty clear visual demonstration. Just compare the image in the middle with the image on the right. The image on the right is the reconstruction without using the clamping. I think it's pretty clear that uh, in all the foliage, there's just more detail uh, in, the, in, in this version than the one in the middle. It's also really important to note that uh, the amount of detail that you lose from using neighborhood clamping is strongly related to the sampling rate of the current frame samples. So in the case when we're doing temporal upsampling, that means uh, for all the current frame samples, we're using a lower sampling rate. That basically means we have to calculate the color bonding box from a sparser set of current frame samples. And this will just further cause reduction uh, in the detail in the final reconstructed image. So let's demonstrate things again visually. On the left, we have a reconstruction result of using TAU with a quarter resolution input. And on the right, we have the exact same thing, TAU using a quarter res input, but with neighborhood clamping disabled. I think it's, it's really obvious that just by using neighborhood clamping alone, it's causing a huge reduction in the detail in the final reconstructed image. This is another set of comparison with TAU and with quarter res input. And again, just by toggling neighborhood clamping alone, we're getting a drastic difference in the details in the final reconstructed image. But remember, we cannot simply just turn off neighborhood clamping as if you do that, you get huge amount of ghosting and lagging in the final image. And that, that's even more unacceptable than, than a blurred image. Blurriness and loss in details are actually not the only type of artifact that you might get from using heuristics like neighborhood clamping. Another really common type of artifact is temporal instability. And we're going to just play this clip for you here. As you can clearly see that a lot of the faces on the containers are rapidly shimmering. And that is because the stripes of the container are a pretty high frequency and they happen to be at the right frequency, the Nyquist frequency relative, relative to the screen space pixel sampling frequency. So that's why they actually triggered a moray pattern on the input. So that's why we're seeing, you know, just rapid temporal instability going on. Similar to the losing detail problem, temporal instability will also get even worse when we're doing temporal upsampling. That is because when doing temporal upsampling, our input buffer is of low resolution. Therefore, that means we have less useful information for us to calculate the bounding box used for neighborhood clamping. And if we do clamp with those worse bounding box, we'll just end up worse than the artifact. And in this in this example, we're looking at 540p upscale to 1080p using TAU and again with neighborhood clamping turned on. And it's obviously that now basically the area of the shimmering just gotten bigger and also the pattern of the moray also get worsened too. So why does this happen? Let's dive deep into this. The picture on the left is showing a magnified view of the input samples in the highlighted region over the course of four consecutive frames. And it's hard to, not hard to know this, notice that there's more a pattern going on. It's pretty heavy. And that is because the content of the, the stripes on the container is actually at the Nyquist frequency relative to the pixel sampling frequency. And you'll notice, also notice that the pattern itself is changing per frame because we're actually changing the jitter per frame because we want to distribute the samples across multiple frames. And so the sample, the pattern is temporarily very high frequency, is changing per frame, but it's spatially low frequency because you can still see a really obvious pattern going on. It's not like high frequency noise. So if we zoom in on this uh, a fixed 3x3 three three pixel neighborhood region, you'll see that for a 3x3 three three neighborhood, basically the color of the neighborhood is oscillating between black and white. And remember, we use the color neighborhood to 
calculate the bounding box used for our neighborhood clamping technique. And, um, and if you clamp with this type of bounding box, you basically will just throw away whatever information that you have accumulated in the previous frame samples. To put it in the diagram, like, like basically in this case, the, in this case, the ground shoes function that we try to reconstruct is indeed a, an oscillating function that is pretty high frequency. But the samples that we get from the current frame and previous frames, they oscillate a lot. And if we apply neighborhood clamping, we are pretty much just throwing away uh, a lot of samples essentially. And then we, we can end up with a reconstruction that is only with information that is uh, collected from the current frame, which is gonna be look something that's closer to this oscillating Mori pattern. And to demonstrate that, let's look at what does it look like for TAU to do 540p to 1080p without the neighborhood clamping. So you can see the shimmery is drastically reduced. There's still some shimmering going on like at the top of the container, but it's like much better than what we saw earlier. So let's do a quick summary over the challenges of the existing approaches that can be applied for real-time rendering super resolution. We first looked at the single frame approach. The problem with the single frame approach is first that it's really an ill post problem. You have to invent new information that doesn't exist, and this typically leads to blurry image quality. And even if you use something fancier like deep learning based approach, the reconstructed result that you get is still inconsistent with native rendering. They just might look different, will have a different style that, that is not desirable. And finally, there's no constraint in such techniques to make them pr to produce temporally stable image sequences. So they're not really suitable. And then we also looked at multi-frame frame approach. And this should definitely lead to better results. But in reality, you still have to use heuristics to either detect or rectify the previous frame samples that you have collected before you can use them. Otherwise, you end up having really bad artifact lagging, ghosting in the result image. And the image quality is just largely limited by these set of heuristics. And uh, when they doesn't work, and they don't always work, uh, especially during when you're doing temporal upsampling. Uh, you'll introduce blurriness, temporal instability, or ghosting. For DLSS 2.0, we definitely took the multi-frame approach, as we believe that with the multi-frame approach, we can very cheaply work with a lot more samples and therefore getting a much higher image quality in the final reconstruction. So how is DLSS 2.0 different from some of the existing spatial temporal upsampling technique in real-time rendering, like checkable rendering, TAA, or TAU. So those techniques, they use handcrafted heuristics to compute the weight that it combines samples collected over the course of multiple frames. And neighborhood clamping is one of the heuristics that we show today, and we've showed that it's not really robust, and when it fails, it'll produce artifacts like temporal instability, uh, additional loss of details, or even ghosting. And there are many other heuristics that people have invented over the years that I haven't really talked about in this talk. Like, for example, motion adaptive temporal integration, Luma adaptive temporal integration, and so on. But those are, none of those heuristics are really perfect. With the LSS 2.0, we train a neural network offline on supercomputers on tens of thousands of really high quality images to just learn the optimal strategy to combine samples collected over multiple frames. So instead of using handcrafted heuristics, we're completely using a data-driven approach. And this resulted in a significant increase in terms of efficiency when it comes to using data that's collected over multiple frames. And it, it, it's what basically allows DLSS to even reconstruct some of the really challenging situation like the Moray pattern really well. Now let's demonstrate how DLSS 2.0 would handle this really challenging situation for Moray that I showed earlier. And in this case, we're gonna do a 540p to 1080p upsampling. Now the video is playing. It, you're, what you're looking at right now is not a screenshot, it's a video. So, but you can see it, it's solid stable. It's even more stable than 1080p native rendering with TAA. Now let's look at another set of comparison in the forest. This is the native 1080p rendering, so it should be treated as the reference. And this is by 40p to 1080p upsampled using DLSS 2.0. You see, it's, it's definitely really close with the native rendering. And this is by 40p to 1080p upsampling with TAU, which is a really uh, one of the best non-deep learning based spatial temporal upsampling for real-time rendering. Let's put them side by side. And I think it's pretty clear that, that the 
the 540p version from DLSS 2.0 is really close with native rendering, and it's, it, it definitely looks better than the non-deep non learning based TAU at 540p. I'll show one more set of comparison in this different scene. So again, this is native 1080p rendering, and this should be treated as the reference. And next, this is the 540p upscale to 1080p using DLSS 2.0. Again, it's really close to native rendering. Finally, we have 540p upsampled to 1080p with TAU. Now, let's look at them side by side again. With this side by side comparison, I definitely wouldn't disagree if you think that the DLSS 2.0 results at 540p is actually looking more detailed than the 1080p native rendering. And of course, it's looking a lot better than 540p from TAU, which is already run the re one of the really best uh, spatial temporal reconstruction for real time rendering. Okay, hopefully now you're convinced that DLSS 2.0 is providing superior image quality compared with some of the existing spatial temporal upsampling technique uh, in real-time rendering. Now let's take a look at how do we integrate DLSS 2.0 into a modern game engine. The changes that you need to make in order to integrate DLSS into the rendering pipeline is not very invasive. The first thing you do is to, of course, render the scene at low resolution, and this step includes all the geometry drawing, the G-buffer filling, as well as all the dynamic lighting and shadowing, uh, also including all the screen space effect like SSR, SSAO, and finally all the ray tracing effects. So all of these th things should be rendered at low resolution so you can, you can gain performance. After all the geometry and shadings are done, we need to insert DLSS at the place where normally anti-aliasing would happen. Because right now, DLSS 2.0 is actually a combined pass for both anti-aliasing and supersampling. So the existing anti-aliasing solution in the engine should be replaced. And after DLSS, the output will be at high resolution. After DLSS, post-processing should continue. And this typically includes things like motion blur, loom, lens flare, chromatic aberration, and tone mapping. And after post-processing, the renderer should just proceed normally to render all the GUI before displaying the final image on screen. DLSS 2.0 is not just a pure image processing algorithm. We can't just put it there and expect it to work. It is actually designed to work alongside with the renderer. And that's why we need to make some adjustment and changes to the rendering process itself. But hopefully the changes that's required for DLSS 2.0 is way not as invasive as things like checkable rendering. So most of them should be pretty easy to implement. The first adjustment that you need to make is that you need to add viewport jitter to the renderer because we need samples to be evenly distributed within the pixel over multiple frames. And this is pretty much the same with TAA. So if your engine already have TAA, then it, you don't really have much to do. We do have two suggestions though. The first one is about the sampling pattern. We've gotten really good result with Holton sequence because it really covers the area of the pixel well. And all the images that I showed today were using were rendered using Halton sequence. And the second is that the number of faces in the jitter should be scaled linearly as the area of the pixel cover grow when you render at low resolution. For example, if you do 4x pixel upsampling, then a single pixel will be covering four times the area of those in high resolution. So you need to accordingly increase the number of faces of jitter uh, by 4x in order to cover the, the low resolution pixel well. The second thing that you need to adjust is that you need to make sure to use the same high resolution texture as native resolution rendering by adjusting the mid bias according to the upscaling ratio. Because DLSS is not really designed to somehow enhance texture details or turn low resolution texture into high resolution textures. But hopefully this one is still simple enough. You just need to set the mid bias based on the equation that I wrote here. The third adjustment is about stochastic or dithered effect. So some of the rendering effects such as SSAO or SSR would temporarily jitter their samples over multiple frames. So similar to the viewport jitters, the faces of the jitter used for the stochastic effects will also need to be scaled up according to the uh, upscaling ratio. Depending on the implementation, the fourth adjustment that you might need to make is for ray tracing and denoising. The reason is that the denoisers people develop nowadays doesn't always produce a pure clean image they somewhat rely on the final TAA pass at the end to further clean things up. And in this sense, the current DLSS cannot replace TAA for that because DLSS is not trained or cannot really be trained to deal with partially denoised input as there are just millions of different implementations for all kinds of denoisers out there. 
So there are two ways to walk around this. The first is just to improve your denoiser, make, the, make their output cleaner and temporally more stable. So you don't really have to rely on, on the further TA pass to clean things up. And the other option is to simply run the existing TA passes right after denoising. That way we kind of complete the whole denoising pipeline that was run earlier without VLSS. Next, let's look at how do we actually insert DLSS 2.0 in the middle of the rendering pipeline. The entire DLSS 2.0 algorithm has been implemented inside the NGX SDK. You can pretty much just treat this SDK as a black box and then feed it with a bunch of input that the SDK expects. The inputs include the low resolution images, the jitter offsets, motion vectors, the depth buffer, as well as the exposure of the entire frame. And then the, the SDK will just return you a, a upsampled high quality image, which can then be consumed by the post-processing pipeline. Finally, after DLSS, we need to make some changes to the post-processing pipeline as well. The main thing that you need to change about the post-processing pipeline is that now the entire post-processing will run at the upscaled resolution. And that means it's at a different resolution with the regular shading or with all the G-buffer size. From the engine perspective, uh, depending on the implementation, that means you'll basically have to maintain two resolutions, one for the regular rendering and the other for the upscaled post-processing. And within each one of the post-processing shaders, when you access G-buffer, you need to be careful that now the G-buffer is actually smaller than the viewport. But hopefully you will still think this is not too bad. And, it, and for both for the performance that you gain from DLSS, uh, we hope it's still worth it. Finally, I'm concluding my talk by pointing you guys to our latest UE4 DLSS 2.0 branch. It is available through our DLSS developer program right now. You can use this branch to basically check out the image quality and performance and generalization capabilities of DLSS 2.0. We also hope that this branch is going to be useful for you to study the integration of DLSS 2.0 in case you're interested in integrating DLSS into your own engine. With that, I want to say thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.